17 levels, 240 plus entries. This is well over eight hours of content packed into one big behemoth of a man. Normally I stay away from large icebergs, but I will be breaking down this iceberg chart in segments per subscriber request. So, buckle your fuckles, send your dad to the shadow realm, watch Jimmy Neutron again, I don't fucking know. This is the ultimate unsolved serial killings and mass murders iceberg. Now, zooming in a little to read the legal fine print where we see that OP can actually get away with murder with the contract that we've accidentally signed, we can see that this is not just about unsolved serial killings and mass murderers. There's also a bunch of other super fun topics that are great for your mental health. Now, because of the raw fucking size of this thing and the fact that I'm not a porn star's asshole, we will be breaking this down into 17 different videos. This video will cover the first entry. Now, normally I keep these introductions brief, so I'm just gonna shut the fuck up and get into telling you about all this cool stuff. Starting this bad boy off strong, we have the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac Killer is probably the most well-known serial killer in American history. He operated between December 1968 and October 1969. <laughs> nice. What isn't nice is the 37 people he claimed to have murdered in California in northern Nevada, which is really neat. You know, maybe some people that I know that knew some people got murdered by the Zodiac Killer. Now, there are several confirmed murders, but the other 30 are unconfirmed. Surprisingly enough, though, two survived. Now, he gets the name Zodiac Killer from the fact that he puts Zodiac-related and astrology-related symbols on his ciphers, which some remain unsolved to this day, including one that starts in plain English, my name is, and then just garbled bullshit. There's been a few different people who've taken a crack or two at the Zodiac Killer ciphers, but because none of us are the Zodiac Killer, we can't figure out what the fuck it means. Arthur Lay Allen is one suspect of who may be the Zodiac serial killer, but it's very unlikely that Mr. Allen is because he's had the police up his asshole for approximately 20 years now. The other person was one Mr. Lawrence K, singled out by Fekal Zoroy, 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 who was an engineer who attempted to crack the codes and supposedly made some progress. However, the FBI has kind of completely disregarded it, so maybe that's not who it was. Also, Displate, you should give me a sponsor. Jack the Ripper. Another example of an incredibly super famous and reported on case, Jack the Ripper was a man in 19th century London who got his jollies off by murdering prostitutes. Yeah. Everybody's heard of this guy in some form or another, and Jack the Ripper, who he is, remains one of the largest unsolved cold cases to this day. It's kind of like trying to bang a character from Twilight, but some people still think that they can deduce who it was almost two centuries after the fact. Let's just accept that it was some weirdo fucking hookers and then finishing the job by killing them in London in the 19th century and give up on it, because holy shit, unless you invent a time machine, that's never going to happen. And if you invent a time machine, just prevent me from ever existing to begin with, because then you never invent the time machine, and now we're stuck in an infinite loop. St. Valentine's Day Massacre 1929. The Prohibition is in full swing, and the American government, in typically stupid fucking fashion, managed to create its own problems by causing gangbanging as a whole. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre is when Al Capone rolled up to the competition with the guns. He was not slacking, he was strapping. And he and his boys with Thompson submachine guns fucking gunned down the Moran gang. 
These were the people who were stealing a lot of Capone's business by price cutting his liquor, and by fucking capping all of their asses, they couldn't sell booze no more, could they? Velisca X Murders It's June 10th, early in the morning, of 1912. The Moore family and their two guests are still soundly sleeping when an unknown perpetrator breaks in with an axe and kills all of them. It's like something out of a shitty B-list horror film, but all of them were horrifically murdered with an axe and never ever was the case solved. And considering it happened 109 years ago, it's not gonna be solved, ever. But, on the upside, because capitalism is a thing, you can now go visit the hollowed ground of a fucking horrific murder for a low, low price. 2001 Anthrax Attacks The 2001 Anthrax Attacks is when a wacko by the name of Bruce Edwards Ivins mailed multiple letters full of anthrax spores to various Democratic senators and other people that I guess this guy just didn't fucking like. Why would he do this? Politics. Because we all love it. Now, not to mention the letters themselves are just kind of weird. You can't stop us. We have this anthrax. You die now. Death to America. Death to Israel. Allah is great. The fact that this guy is also bringing in a little bit of Islamophobia to spice this up makes it pretty funny, pretty stupid. Now, because of the fact that people who do killing in this manner tend to be fucking cowards, Bruce Edward Ivins killed himself in 2008, and I hope Satan has the whole fucking broomstick up his asshole while we wait for me to die so I can get down there and have my go at him too. September 29th, 1982. One 12-year-old Mary Kellerman of Elk Grove Village, Illinois, takes an extra-strength Tylenol capsule and then kills over and fucking dies. Over the next couple of days and the next few hours even, at least six other people will die in similar circumstances after taking an extra strength Tylenol capsule, and then just killing over. So what the fuck is happening here? Well, somebody poisoned the water hole, but in this case, the water hole is Tylenol, and the poison is potassium cyanide. Yeah, the shit that stops your heart. Now, no one ever figured out who it was that was actually putting cyanide in Advil, and it appeared to be only a few bottles. But because this is 1982, this is peak capitalism and consumerism, there is not jack diddle or shit. You can just open that bottle of Tylenol up right at the fucking store and drop anything in, really. Now, it was these murders that actually led to tampering laws being put into place that required packaging reforms for pills, which who would have ever fucking thought letting the general public have access to your shit was a stupid fucking idea. Hinterkaifeck Murders On a small farmstead in Bavaria, in the afternoon of March 31st, 1922, a Friday, Maria Baumgartner arrived at the farm. She was a new maid, and Maria's sister had escorted her there and left the farm after a short stay. Maria's sister was the most likely person to have ever seen the residents alive after that point. Four days passed between the murders of every resident within the house and the discovery of the bodies. It was coffee sellers that had arrived in Hinterkaifeck to take an order, but when no one responded to knocks on the window, they walked around the yard and found no one, and they only noticed that the gate to the machine house was open, and then they opened the door. The children were absent without excuse, and this is also what led up to the murders being discovered. There were six deaths, and they were all killed with a matak and all of the bodies were stacked in the barn, having been drawn in one by one. Prior to this incident, the maids and others reported hearing sounds in the attic, and footprints in the snow, 
leading up to the house but stopping where you could get onto the roof had been seen beforehand. Who did it or why they did it remains unsolved to this day, and because it's been almost a hundred years since the Hinterkaifeck murders, I don't think it's going to be solved anytime soon. The Ketty Cabin Murders In July of 1979, Glenna Susan Sharp left her husband in Connecticut. She and her five children all separated and moved to Northern California, something that would prove to be a fatal mistake because Northern California is an unholy place cursed by gods beyond our knowledge. Continuing with this, she lived with her 15-year-old son, John, 14-year-old daughter, Sheila, 12-year-old daughter, Tina, and two younger sons, Rick and Greg. They were, respectively, 15, 14, 12, 10, and 5. At around 7 a.m. on the morning of April 12th, Sheila returned to number 28, the trailer her family had been staying in, and discovered the dead bodies of Sue, John, and Dana in the house's living room. All three had been bound with medical tape and electrical cords. Tina was absent from the home, while the younger children, Rick and Greg, were unharmed in an adjacent bedroom. Initial reports stated that the young boys had slept through the incident, though this was later contradicted. Upon discovering the scene, Sheila rushed back to someone else's house and called the police, and from there the initial investigation drew no leads. The murder weapons were found at the scene, but they proved to be nearly useless, a hammer and knife that had belonged to the family. There were no suspects and no reason to believe that anyone around them would have done it, and to this day, the case remains completely unsolved. Cleveland Torso Murderers Contrary to the name, this guy wasn't running around and just killing torsos. No, the Cleveland Torso Killer was someone who killed between 12 to 20 victims, chopped them into little itty bitty pieces, and then dropped the torsos in King's Run, a very poor part of Cleveland. This happened between 1935 and 1938, and even though it was the case against him was eventually even led by a famed lawman, Elliot Ness, he was never found because nobody could ever figure out what the hell was happening. Only two of the victims were ever positively identified, and to this day it remains a mystery and likely always will. And that does it for level one of the ultimate unsolved serial killings and mass murders iceberg. Now because of the sheer raw size of this thing and the fact that I don't want to spend the next month and a half exclusively researching serial killers, this is going to be something that comes twice a week. Each video will discuss one level of the iceberg, and twice a week there will be a video released on it. Now if you made it this far, which thank you if you did, just go ahead and subscribe so you can catch the rest of this, because I'm not doing it all in one go, and I don't think anyone could. With that in mind, if you want more of my content, my iceberg charts in general are kept in one very convenient playlist, and every video on this fucking behemoth will also be kept in one very convenient playlist. Once again, thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful time. Memento Mori.